week 11 of eMarketing. This is the week where we're going to take a brief detour away from the desktop based eMarketing protocol that we've been embracing for most of the semester and have a quick look at the opportunities that are present within the mobile device arena. We're also right at the back end of the season. Your next major challenge on the horizon is the finalization of the ePortfolio. And for all of you who haven't been working on it on the way through, the finalization of the email marketing portfolio, because however it goes, it's got to get finalized. Whether you're finalizing it from scratch or you're finalizing it from progress. I don't mind because it's all about how you've chosen to embrace the way you want to run your semester. Now, there's a couple of things about mobile phones that I want to just draw people's attention to from the outset. The first one is the ringtone marketplace used to be absolutely phenomenal. Uh, the effort you'd go to to be listening to the song that you wanted to capture as the ringtone on the radio with your mobile device, through to the fact now that we're basically, uh, most of the time our mobile phones are on silent or default. The multi, the problem became quite apparent when iTunes ran ringtone versions of songs for prices above the song itself. And then it just became easier to set the song as your ringtone, which inadvertently led to one of the greatest Australian remixes of all time when Pendulum re have got the official license to remix the ABC news theme because Rob Swire had an unofficial license as his ringtone and his phone went off in a meeting one day. So one of the great moments of Australian humanity was entirely due to the fact that somebody forgot to switch his phone to silent before the meeting began. For me, I don't actually know what my phone sounds like because I've had it on silent since silent was an option. Uh, just not a thing. Yeah, mobile marketing. A couple of disclaimers up front. It's a huge arena and it would justify its own subject. So we're just going to give you a teaser taster here. We're going to do a short overview of potential and possibility. I've known about the mobile marketing as a separate aspect of work since I was doing my PhD in the 1990s, where one of my colleagues who was also doing his PhD, he was studying M marketing at the time, I was doing discontinuous innovations. I would always jokingly say, well, why don't we have T marketing, as in telephone marketing? It was extended to telemarketing, that's why. But I never really took uh, the mobile platform as a standalone, independent, isolated parameter largely because the work I was doing around e-marketing in the early 1990s and mid-1990s was showing me that the behaviours that you conducted online were very similar to the behaviours you conducted everywhere else. The person at the far end of the technology, similar needs and wants. It's just the technology itself changed the distribution channels. The other thing I should point out is that the mobile phone as a technology is kind of old. Uh, the 1981 mobile phone, they were the size of, like they were giant besser block bricks of devices. Uh, I distinctly recall as a youngling being at a, an event where someone was showing off his brand new mobile phone and it was like he had a desktop computer slapped under his arm the phone rings in the middle of this event because we hadn't got silent at that point and it was a wrong number. At that point there were like eight mobile phone users in Australia uh, and someone got the wrong number which was awesomely funny. The other thing is that the mobile phone technology when it began began as an extension of the CB radio which was an extension of the military backpack radios. We commercialized a militarized technology uh, they were normally car phones and car mounted phones because you needed the car to carry the rest of the phone and we're now down to technologies that uh, fit in 
pockets of men's clothing and women's clothing manufacturers flatly refuse to accept that pockets are a real thing. So if any of you want to get on that and you know, make a fortune making proper pockets, the market's there, capture it. Second thing to know, the iPhone. When that little beastie showed up in uh, 2007, I was using a BlackBerry, and I stayed using a BlackBerry until version four of the iPhone showed up, at which point my BlackBerry had died of old age and it was time to transfer technologies. The first iPhone was not great. I liked the iPod, uh, I liked the iPod Touch, and the iPhones were a bit rubbish. I'm now on an iPhone several generations old, about three gens old, because they need to do something with rel something of relative advantage to make me move platforms. And functionally, at the moment, the next if they don't bring out an augmented reality technology on the next phone, this poor little device I've got is going to limp along until such time as it dies of old age. Because the key is the relative advantage. The next gen phone does the same things as my current gen phone. So I needed to do something new. Last thing in the history is I just want to mention a little shout out here. This is the Nokia 9000. It came out in 1996. It was the first phone to combine internet, email, faxes, and mobile phones. You can see by its little flip-up keyboard. I did my PhD about this technology. I could not afford one of these phones whilst doing my PhD, and at no point has my budget ever stretched to only a Nokia 9000. So it was a technology that was discontinuous because faxes were machines that sat on tables and desktops computers sat on tables and desktops phones were plugged into walls mobile phones at this stage were still big and blocky and ugly things you could win knife fights with and this little device or oh, this medium sized phablet shaped device shows up and goes what if you could send a fax from on the road? What if you could receive a fax in grainy one bit technology color? I could honestly never see a value for sending a fax into a Nokia 9000, but enough people said, you know, that's not a bad idea. We should have the internet on a phone and look where we are now. But 96 to now. Also, Nokia's man, hell of a drug. Uh, I broke Nokia. I've broken two Nokia 3310s, and I the only technology I miss for the aesthetic are the Matrix phone, the Matrix Nokia's. That little spring-loaded snap sensation was great for back when audio was a thing. We actually used to make phone calls. Absolute rubbish now. Terrible technology. It's, I love the fact that they've restored the clamshell split folding phone with the new touch screens and everything else. But frankly, uh, as much as I loved them back in the day, being able to do the whole tricorder slide thing, being able to do the whole uh, communicator flip from Star Trek original series. Yeah, our technology got better. So the question you want to ask yourself here, and now, I've made a little question. Here's the value of mobile-based marketing. This is a B2B business question. What is the value of the device being a marketing platform rather than the value that we could create through having a mobile phone? The separation here is for a reason. A lot of the things that a mobile phone can do for you in a marketing sense is simply platform replacement. If you remember really early in semester, we talked about that model of the, Sam, the SAMA model. Substitute, augment. Mobile phones are phenomenal for substitution. The fact that we've now got tap and go off near field communication on a mobile phone means it's a wallet substitute. It's now even a wallet augmentation because you can transfer money between people. When it first came out, it was a redefine. The fact that 
you are no longer physically tied to a location to take and make phone calls. The liberation that made for people and society was phenomenal. That if I wanted someone to ring me, I had to be within meters of the device in my house, thus locking me into a geophysical location. These days, the question is, what can you do as a marketer with this substitution, augmentation, modification device that's of value to you as a marketer and of value to your customer as an augmentation? So I see a lot of value in the product augmentation and that's mostly where I focus my attention as a marketer. I, again, this is one of the things I want to really highlight here is I know my limits as a professional marketer and my skill sets are predominantly desktop e-marketing when we come to the focus. I like mouse keyboard interface. I'm okay on tablets, I'm okay on phone, but I'm better in the computer domain. So there are opportunities in here that I'm not going to recognize and relay. If you see them, you know them, and you want to share them in the forums, please let me know. So a couple of ways I want to look at this. Uh, the device-based considerations. This is just the, the quick shopping list of what we're about to talk about in terms of technology does certain things and technology then enables distribution channels. Like I said, I see the phone's real strength is it is a product that consumers buy to give us as marketers a new channel to reach them. So the first point of call I want to mention is I want to, uh, in terms of a future technology I absolutely want, I want us to have branded phone calls. I want it to be that if you are calling from a government agency, Telstra, Optus, Vodafone, whoever the heck's providing that call, it's not an unknown number, it's a branded number. Because we, I, I don't answer unknown calls, I let them go to uh, voicemail and call back. Frankly, because there's a lot of junk data, there's a lot of junk calls, there's a lot of junk stuff happening. We need to clean out the junk. And that junk is not marketing. That junk does not create value. That, that junk does not provide benefit. It is junk. It is rubbish. So as soon as we can get branded communications into the mobile phone that I, when the ANU calls you, the ANU crest pops up on your screen, that is the thing that we're going to need and want. There's some technology. I know that there's verification and validation technologies required. Spoofing is a, a high risk event there of somebody uh, mimicking an authenticated image. I also know that because it can be displayed, it can be copied, so there's all sorts of challenges there, but frankly it's doable, and it's doable within the realms of risk. Second thing up, uh, I'm a big fan of the SMS. It's old school. Uh, I like the use of the SMS as a permission channel. Uh, now, I periodically do media calls and give comment to journalists, and the smart journalists text me, identify themselves to me, and then say, here's my qu question I'm going to have for you, or the general area I want to discuss. SMS to confirm you're available, and when can I call you? So that way, when I get, to start with, I can save the SMS, I can save the number and ID the journalist call, incoming call, but also by creating permission, I am far more likely to be able to be available for them. So Tuesday afternoons between three and six is a reasonably high danger period for someone from a journal, from a media outlet to send me a message and say, hi, are you free for a quick chat? It's like, no, not until after six. In which case I miss being on the story because they need to have the deadline done for tomorrow morning. But a prompt here, an SMS here, a message of seeking permission, you know, can we call you? That makes a difference because it turns it from interrupt to 
permission based. Second thing is the SMS as augmentation of the service product is just amazing because I periodically book a, you book a dental appointment for six months into the future, you arrive six months into the future and you've forgotten about it until you get the little text saying, hi this is your dentist, in three days time you've got an appointment with us. Confirm yes if you still need the appointment. Has your face fallen off? Those prompts, those reminders, those cues, the delivery notifications, all these elements that don't need to be phone calls, don't need to be emails, they just need to be a quick buzz, package inbound, package arrived. Now video, uh, you don't have a little graphic here for video because they're just too many choices. As you've noticed in the live learning events, I will bring my mobile phone in as a foldback monitor. I will put it up on the table in front of me so I can see what a participant in my Zoom room sees. So I like, it's a, I think it's a great little uh, thing that we've got all these video options, video applications. It just so happens that my friends and I don't actually video call each other that often. Uh, during the pandemic we were sort of getting together for a happy hour um, cross-country chat but at the end of the day uh, we text each other we're, we're all about the keyboard and mouse and Facebook Messenger but if you complete I, I genuinely admire the people who are walking around the place with their mobile phones on a FaceTime chat to someone you know, somewhere else on the planet who's also walking around the place chatting to them it's like yeah it's not my scene, it's not my thing, but damn, that's a good use of technology. And also, that's the future, that was the, one of the Jetsons futures that we were promised, and it's nice to see it in reality. From a commercial marketer's perspective, I don't think we've really mastered this as a platform just yet. I think there's a lot more opportunities for service delivery over mobile phone video, for consumers who are looking for consulting, coaching. I mean, imagine if you could go head down the park to do your uh, street workout, you know, do your gym workout, just pop a call through to a, a trainer saying, hey, can you check my form? Or pop a message out, record it, check my form, get feedback, get live feedback as you're performing. Now, one of the things with the apps are uh, apps I think of apps more as jo like genres rather than individual standalone elements. And yeah, that's how messy my phone is. That's the app library in the back end of my phone. <sighs> i got to clean that out sometime. But when I think about it, I think about it in terms of, now I think like a marketer. Service provision, so software as service. And that's where I'm looking at things like the you know, I've got the Suncorp banking app, I've got the um, Seek and the um, LinkedIn and the... So I've got these sort of service platforms. Then I've got my distribution channels, I've got my YouTube app and I've got a few other channels. I've got... Yeah, I don't use TikTok as you might have noticed throughout the semester, but I love Instagram. I'm, I'm big on Instagram. I just absolutely adore it as a platform of taking snapshots and sharing snapshots and captions big on that so I've got a creation I've got a producer platform I can put content to the world uh, I have a no I have one or two ad delivery platforms I've dumped so many mobile games off that I used to play that I've kicked off the phone because the updates have brought in more dark patterns that I don't want to support the company who's involved in it so I'm not going to name names, suffice to say, Candy Crush, you are, uh, your producers and your manufacturers are bad people. Uh, Zynga Games, you are bad people. If you're a player of those games, you're okay, you're alright, you're a good person. Uh, if you're a maker of those games, no, you, you're not a good person. If you know intentionally and willingly and you go out to do harm, then at least own up and accept it. Now, the other thing about the apps is my phone is one half value and ownership and one half value in use I have a number of applications in there that I have to reassure me that I've got them if I need them but I'm yet to have actually needed them 
just a quick run down the sidebar here uh, that is we have two apps for photo manipulation uh, we have a tech a ride sharing app for an area I haven't been to for a couple of years. Uh, we the VLC media player, despite the fact that I don't actually have a media save to my phone, I've got that in case I save something to my phone that I can play later. When the one place I'm likely to be stream saving content to my phone from would be YouTube, so I've got a YouTube app somewhere in here that I can use instead. So if you're not using the app, you're not getting value from the app. But at the same time, I have sort of, you know, my photography app collection includes things that I don't want to have to download it. The moment I go, I want to use this, I have a couple of lightning capture apps and storm chasing apps. I don't want to have to stop and think. I want to press the button and it be ready to go. So the ownership is value in preparation for use. The value in use the the apps that are on frequent cycle and yeah I'll get a bit of use out of them. Now let's talk a couple of technologies that I do like. Uh, I'm a big fan of geopositioning. Now geofencing and geopositioning is a mobile based technology that's not fully refined yet and still got some challenges uh, and it will get there. So I see this as a five it's present, prevalent at the moment. It's a five to 10 year to be very good. It's okay at the moment. When you search on Google on your mobile, it will ask you for permission to use your location uh, and then Google Maps can pull up your coordinates and give you recommendations based on your proximity to certain items and objects. What I think is going to get interesting around the geofencing and the, geo, the GPS now, the COVID-19 app was a complete failure on this front. The geosensitivity, being able to have the app become aware of certain opportunities or certain assets. So your, yeah, your phone, if you've got it set up with give it permissions, knows where the nearest bus is, knows where the nearest public transport is, can give you recommendations to access uh, you know, time until vehicle arrives. Because that's the other side of it, is the geopositioning, uh, good GPS-based tracking for public transport, buses and cabs, Ubers and the rest, that becomes a value add-on, becomes a risk reduction. It's a functional risk reduction. It's got some good stuff associated. But the other place where I think it's got immense potential we haven't even begun to realise service delivery inclusive of art, entertainment and geo augmentation. A history application that knows where you are and can pull up from a yeah, it's a comprehensive database, it requires content creation, but can pull up aspects of the area around you. A ghost hunting, you know, a ghost hunting tour guide app that can tell you about the history of the area, a sports training app that can give you recommendations for good parkour sites and good street training areas, a street, a street training app that knows when you're in a zone that's got street training equipment, what's there pops up recommendations. Having pseudo smart technology having technology that can pull from a GPS coordinate then pull from a database to provide you with location relevant information that I can see as a major major benefit for the near future and long future of geopositioning having you don't need AI, you don't need machine learning, you need a big database, a lot of humans writing content, and updating that content periodically. Also, Joe is the base of Pokemon Go, which is awesome. Uh, mobile internet. I was really fascinated to see how mobile internet held during 2021. Uh, and 
2020 and 2021 should have driven mobile internet down because we had so many lockdowns and so many points at which we were on our home Wi-Fi networks. Uh, I think, though, what was likely to have happened is mobile technology became the third channel in the house. So you're in a lockdown, there's multiple people in a shared household environment, someone gets the computer, if there's only one computer, say it's a family home and there's shared technology, most people had their own individual phones and one shared PC, laptop or Mac. The phone became the way in which the individuals could still maintain some privacy and control over their engagement to the outside world. Uh, now, as someone who researched mobile internet when it first came out, I think this is one of the best things to have happened to the planet. I genuinely believe that we are going to be a better species for it once we deal with, once we come to terms with the fact that everybody having an anonymous, a pseudo anonymous private window to the world meant that we got a bunch of humanity, um, we got a bunch of human issues that we need to upgrade and patch through that we haven't had to address on mass before because it's always been nicely and neatly segmented away from us. Now it's available for the world to see. We've got some work to do on humans. Other technologies. Uh, look, I am a late, late arrival to the Bluetooth scene. Uh, in part, I never had gear that was good. Uh, early Bluetooth was not good. Well, my early Bluetooth technology experience, the gear was not particularly useful or valuable. The thing that converted me to being a believer was the Bluetooth wireless headphones that stay on when I'm training at the gym. And I have snapped enough headphone cables now to have been convinced that yes, this is a good technology. The next place I think Bluetooth has, again, I believe that the potential for mobile based augmented reality gaming and or augmented reality in general. ARG gaming, augmented reality, Bluetooth is a mechanism that can be, I think, is underutilized at this point in time. Same for near field communications. I'm s simultaneously pleased that the QR code is the dominant medium of check-ins during our, our COVID experience, but I'm equally surprised that nobody was able to mm, Near-field communications missed their window. Not being able to just tap your phone near something should have been, this should have been the big kickstart for it. But it's not. Uh, the other thing with near-field communications is I think it's, at this point, we're still focusing around the phone. I think there are more device opportunities to create service experiences, to create experiences in theme parks, uh, theme parks, museums, art galleries, bookstores, places where being able to pull down additional information by proximity to objects will be useful. That's where I see it. I think the university's got that coming up too. Uh, I'm surprised that we're not, we never really got into using near field communications around our buildings, around our uh, teaching and learning spaces. So many chances, so many chances. But I will say, a couple of years ago, people were talking about the death of the QR code, about how it was over for the technology, and some very smart people I know who are usually quite good about predicting technology wrote off the QR code, said stupid, Nobody goes out there and takes photos of QR codes. It's a dumb technology. It's time to move on, people. It's game over. You know, it's 20 years old. It's never really come out and found a use case scenario. Boy, has it found a use case scenario. There is no bigger use case scenario right now than the existence of the QR code as a check-in mechanism for COVID apps and the fact that you can uh, my standing record now is using a QR code from two meters away. And I'm still trying to get better at that. That's, that, that is my new challenge to see how far back from a QR code I can be to check into a place. 
because I'm pushing the technology. I want to see what a high resolution camera can do in these environments where we've got digital zoom and we've got uh, glass lens based zoom. I want to see how, what you can do. But specifically in this, one of the things about the AR about the QR code is the AR code. Now, Lego was doing this um, in their stores where they had an augmented reality arrangement. Monitor not dissimilar to the one uh, that you'd be using. Uh, webcam in place. The webcam would look at the box that you were holding up, a Lego box, scan the barcode, and then layer over on the screen and a 3D augmentation of the model of the what was in the Lego box. It was like, it's wonderfully gimmicky and it appeals so much to me and I am the target market for this nonsense. But also, so are small children and super excited small children holding up their uh, Disney Frozen model to see the castle and everything else. It is awesome, it's adorable and also it showed me that there is a real opportunity here that QR codes and its successors and there are different types of QR codes that we can create out there. They will give us the potential to map things for computers. So when you're using an augmented reality technology, the goggles that you're wearing or the headset you're wearing can read the QR code and pull up the right data set. It can pull down the right database. So if you combine a QR code with a geolocation, the geolocation knows the general database to pull. The QR code can pull specifics, direct calls to. So you're at a gym, there's a QR code for the machine in the gym. You scan that, it gives you the instructions. You slap your AR code on and it shows you the movement. It shows you what you've got to be doing. So, hey, spot the person who needs to improve their fault, their uh, chest press. Train with a mate. The mate holds up that and sees how close you are to your QR. You've got this, you know, you got this great augmented reality opportunity that can be using these trigger graphics. And of course this brings me into my favourite thing. I will talk about augmented reality until the end of days because to me, this is the future I'm waiting for and the future I'm super excited by. Uh, audio based augmented reality. That's the first thing. I want to emphasize that I see three layers of augmented reality. The first layer, the audio augmentation of reality, is something, it's daily practice for me. I have a headset, I have, I put my soundtrack on, I go out. Uh, when I'm training, when I'm working out of the gym, when I'm doing anything other than recording video, I use audio augmentation to create a superior reality than the one that's present. Two augmented reality... Now this is one of the things I will point out is that I don't use the voice activation systems because I'm constantly playing music so say, hey Siri, hey Google, stop, collaborate, listen. Hey Alexa, play Despacio. I see those as their augmentations to reality. Being able to have a headset that you can just go and ask a question of uh, a voice recognition technology, that is an augmentation. Being able to do things, then tying those augmented audio elements into geolocation, being able to do something like a walking tour where you don't have to stay to a fixed path. You can walk around the city and the audio will respond because it knows where you are. That takes designing, that takes effort, that takes art. That will take a level of magic, but it will be incredible. The second one, uh, Zombies Run. Now I've trained using this um, a few times. The game itself uh, makes a little bit of use of AR in, and geotagging and other things, but when you are walking along, doing your exercise, doing your five, counts to 5k, and 
you've got this immersive story being told through your headset and then a quasi-metallic voice softly behind you says run I'll tell you what I ran it worked I responded so it was an augmentation it was an enhancement of my world uh, I played around a few things I really like Pokemon Go when it first came out through to now uh, the experience of being out in a park in Newcastle with 50 or 60 other people as we were all tracking you know we're moving about this park all trying to find this particular Pokemon in the park and everyone's got their phones up and it's just like this amazing moment of communal shared augmentation all of us were looking for something so the poker walks that were taking place as we were all fight the wrapper of augmented reality on our world uh, it's amazing stuff being done was done in that space the product previews, they're still a bit patchy and dodgy. IKEA does a solidly okay job. Uh, I just noticed that my chair sits well and truly outside the realms of gravity and possibility. But I appreciate the fact it's got a shadow. The fact that they, their AR went and tried to roughly guess the light sources. And the final element of the augmented reality is it can go wrong. That's why we've got the hyper-reality link in there. But I think also when the last place of AR when we get, you know, there's a lot of problems with the Google Glass um, and there's a lot of problems with unsolicited automated face recognition. Uh, you don't have to be a genius to work out how creepy stalkerish it is for general public to have the capacity to find out a woman's name and details about her and then be a creepy stalking bastard. That's why those technologies, we've got to patch society before we get the full end of the, of the good technology. But when we've got the point in time that we can do graphical overlay of our world, we'll be able to throw in art that we haven't thought about before. Now there'll be a, an absolute bucket load of graffiti and there'll be, need, there'll be a need to moderate the digital virtual space and the augmented space, but a consensual augmented reality where you get to opt in to different layers, to different markup layers of the world will be amazing. Not just from a marketing perspective in terms of, you know, a bunch of my colleagues and I see it in terms of ads and offers and stuff. I see it in terms of enhanced products and incredible amounts of history, art displays, music, being able to record a film clip in reality that plays through that you can f basically follow through a live action, live adventure, um, a live storytelling. All these things, these are going to be potentials and possibles. These are all product value propositions. Now, on the reverse end of things, of things that don't need to be mobile phones or enabled with mobile phones, oh my gosh, we do not need this in our cars. Now, full disclaimer, my car was manufactured in 91, he came into the family in 92, and the Redbird has been uh, in my possession since 95. My car may be older than most of you, some of you, many of you, all of you. It has exactly no technology and it doesn't even have a radio anymore. Uh, I don't believe there is a role for app-based I don't think the car should become another platform for app-based mobile. Particularly because it will encourage engineers to do stupid things. This is not value co-creation. This is value destruction. This is taking a device and making it worse unless you pay rent somewhere. There is no marketer's justification for this. Now your accounting side might be able to justify it and say, oh yes, well... We sold them the car, but what if they had to subscribe to a monthly payment so the brakes worked? That's standover merchant. That is bordering on criminal to actually criminal. This idea that you can only, you've got to pay a premium to access all the features that your car is capable of using, doing, driving. No, 
No, that's not value. DLC to make the card go broom is not value. If you are a marketer and you find yourself in these meetings, you stick your heels in, you stand your ground and you fight like hell. You fight for the users, you go full tron on them and you fight. And you make certain that you do not sign off on this because this is wrong, this is harmful. This is value destruction, it harms marketing and we'll cop the blame for it and the bloody engineers will get off scot-free again like they did this time. I saw this, there was a bunch of people going, oh, that's just good marketing. I'm like, no, it's not. It's bloody awful marketing. You're selling a broken product and then ransoming the owner of the product of, well, we could fix it, but we're not gonna unless you pay us more money. It's like, you sold me a broken set of goods. You should sell me a working set of goods and not walk around my place with a hammer, smash my windscreen in and go, we could fix that. Cost you, we could fix that. Don't smash my windscreen to start with. It bothers me because it shouldn't be there. Someone's ethics should have said, this is stupid. Someone's accountant should have said, that's a dumb idea. Someone's lawyer should have said, that's product liability. And the marketer should have brought a baseball bat to the meeting and said, sure, so long as I can take all your teeth. If you want it, you pay for it in teeth. You'll be amazed how people do not want to put that stuff out if they've got to lose it a mouthful of teeth for them. So, not even remotely calming down. Ads, mobile phone ads, as promised in the teaser trailer, why are they so bad? Because there's a market for them. And it hurts, okay? Uh, most of the time I would just go and say, oh look, it's not my market segment, Dev. Not my, not my monkeys, not my circus. It's not my market segment, Therefore, go off and do it. No, what's what's happening here is the mobile ads particularly are designed to elicit a dark pattern response. And one of those responses is to create the smug superiority. So, you know, you see the ad when they're like, oh, this game's so hard. I, I can't get past level 33. I've tried 333,339 times. And it's a put box in box, circle in circle, square in square. And, it's like, and I judge every person who's ever involved in the creation of this. And I judge you harshly. The reason I do it is that it triggers a need, want, response. It triggers a response in a large enough audience of people who goes, Well, I'm smarter than them. I'll show them. They get in and then they get hooked into the cycle of proving superiority and then paying. These are the pay to win players. These are the whales of gambling. These are the people who are going to spend more money than they have to get that little dopamine hit of proving their superiority over others. And I hope it's blood money and I hope it's cursed and I hope it causes heartache to the people who create it. On the other side, way back in the day, we had the general principle that, is that the internet is powered by cats. You know, uh, surprisingly, I have posted very few cat pics during this course. By my standards. I don't care how many I've posted, it's not enough. I should have posted more. But one of the things that's come up, um, there's a, the links here, one of the things about the face swap app, cats reacting badly to face swap app, is quite an interesting thing because what it shows is that the cat can see the screen and processing the screen. There are numerous cases of people who have built little areas for their cats, put in an iPad, shown a fish, shown an aquarium live stream, and the cat sits there watching their favorite TV show, The Fish. Cats can process content on screen. Cats have responded to Zoom calls. Cats have responded to seeing other cats on screen. The implication here is qu actually quite significant in terms of A, what animals are capable of, but B, the fact that if the internet is powered by cats and cats can use the internet, time until we can do value add for cats. Time until we can make products specifically for a cat 
using then gatekeeper using consumer behavior family buying behavior knowing that the human operator is the gatekeeper for their cat's purchasing pattern much the same way parents are for children and the huge market that's out there of child-free pet enabled families collective family units shared housing arrangements with multiple cats how can we sell to cats and cat parents and also how good is face recognition will it be able to have a situation where a cat can have an iPad that's unlocked by face you know cat walks up and your cat's face is scanned and recognized as a key code entry can your cat can we get face recognition on cats so that cats can you know which point in time you, know, you can give your cat a budget and the cat can make its own purchase decisions in the forum there will probably be a link to uh, Billy Speaks a YouTube channel about which has a cat that has a wide range of buttons that the cat uses to communicate with their human and the human uses to communicate with their cat and uh, that's going to distract you as you come into the tail end and need to be focusing on finishing things off you're going to spend ages watching a cat talk to its human all right let's close it out theory and application bringing it around uh, this is one of those ones I brought this old school because um, yeah it's a combination of old school and new school the unified theory of acceptance and use of technology brings together a set of consumer behavior backgrounds but functionally it talks about a modified updated variant of the relative advantage and what's really interesting here is that it also talks about something very close to my own research social influence to trust to performance expectation to behavior the influence of trusted others on your decision to adopt a technology is can they show you a relative advantage for the product are they themselves the relative advantage so there are ways and means by which we can bring together a whole sequence of theoretical established existing theoretical so the uh, the UCA UT model is it's coming in the back end because I think it's one that is an advanced makes sense now you've played with the internet for an extended period uh, where I would see value for this particular framework is if you find yourself in the power play uh, you might find this is a useful way to look around behavioral tension because I'm going to ask you a question about what's next what's next for your project you can think about that the other uh, aspect in this is definitely it's a chance to go performance expectancy would tie in quite nicely to decisions around do I want is the project that I'm doing providing me a relative advantage to my life and as always if you need me connect uh, I'm not going to cite the Kim Possible thing because I can't remember what it is other than if you need me uh, contact me beat me whatever but contact across the platforms over the email or um, send the carrier pigeon the internet is made for cats and my cat could use a carrier pigeon and now dear listeners the end is so much nearer <laughs>